Yo, you're watching Voice of the Heroes. Fool, you fool. Welcome back to Voice of the Heroes. And if you're watching us for the first time, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, click that notification bell so you can be notified when your favorite hero or villains pop up. And today we got a huge special guest. That's right, man. We got the legend himself, Phil Parson. Welcome to Voice of the Heroes. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Good to be here. Also, let me introduce our co-host for the evening. We have Lava. Lava, let them know where they can find you at. You can find me under Senpai Lavatron, IG, YouTube, X, all the platforms. Hello, everyone. And we have the DBZ GOAT. That's right, man. My boy, President Rose, is in the building. Rose, let them know where they can find you at. Find me on YouTube, uh, President Rose, or you can find me on Twitter, President Rose One. All right, so those are my two platforms. All right, let me get right into the interview. Phil, you've been in so many great animes, video games. Your catalog is so huge. Which one do you feel like elevated to your career to the point it's at now? Well, uh, being a part of Dragon Ball is nice for a voice actor just because it's one of those evergreen projects that that um, caught fire and so stays relevant years after production. I mean, it's like being a live actor and having been in Star Trek. You know, mm. the, the dudes that are still alive from that original cast in the 60s uh, still have fans. They they still get their, they sign autographs at conventions. And that was, uh, you know, going on 60 years ago. Um, uh, because they just happen to be part of something that just, for whatever reason, uh, became part of the zeitgeist. And Dragon Ball is one of those things, so. I think definitely if I hadn't got been lucky enough to get cast in Dragon Ball, then I probably still would have done, because I was doing anime voices for Funimation before I did Dragon Ball, but if I had not been a part of that, then I don't think I would be uh, on this podcast right now. Mm, what was some of the voices that you did in fun for Funimation? Uh, the first thing I ever did was for um, a direct-to-video series they were doing uh, called Lupin the Third. You guys ever see that one? Not Lupin. No, sorry. Lupin is as good. You have Lupin is. Y'all sleeping on Lupin the Third? <laughs> what is wrong I with you guys? I seen something like that on Netflix. Don't they got like Lupin on Netflix or something? Oh no, Lup um, who was also in Lupin the Third that we just interviewed? Was it Michael Yurchak? No, I forgot who it was. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. Lava shaming you boys for your anime. I am shaming. <laughs> <now. laughs> Shame. Uh, Lupin the Third is a classic. I, have, well, I, just, I like these guys. I I was not an anime guy myself. I I had um when I was a kid, I'd watched like you know Speed Racer and stuff that was. I know Speed Racer. That, yeah, that was <laughs> before they had the term anime. It was just cartoon. As a kid, you didn't even know that it was not like other things. You just you know it was all just cartoons when you were a kid. We didn't have those distinctions. Although I remember watching one called Star Blazers that was on after school every day. And uh, I was aware that it was different in the sense that it was an ongoing story, you know. Uh, it was a big epic tale, and each episode was a was a serialized part of that tale. And then the stakes were much higher. Like uh, one of the main characters died halfway through, and you know that shit didn't happen on Popeye. You know what I mean? So <laughs> you were aware that it was, it was something different, but you know we didn't know as kids in the American culture at the time. Like, oh no, th this is like. Uh, these are made in Japan for adults to watch. This is not something that's made just to babysit kids after school, you know. But like always, when you're a kid, you're engaged by something that doesn't condescend to you, you know. Um, but so when I got Lupin the Third, I didn't know what it was. It just I'd heard about the studio and went and auditioned for it. The character was a an old retired British spy. Um, it was a Lupin the Third movie called The Pursuit of Harry Mouse Treasure. I don't know if Lava knows it so well that she knows him by title, but not that one. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I was just doing that one project, but um, I think they kept using me because at that, this is like 20 plus years ago, early two thousands. And the, uh, the recording process of Funimation was more primitive than we didn't have like pro tools that can, you know, that nowadays, like I just did a session today and I still try to get the the timing of my line to fit the flaps, but I just throw it out in the ballpark because I know the engineers can stretch and squish and they can make lines fit. You know, it's not that often you have to do a second take unless the director just wants a different kind of read. 
But back then it was all on videotape. It was a lot more primitive. And so uh, it was really, they really wanted actors who could kind of get a feel for that rhythm for how to uh, time your lines. A lot of really good stage actors, which is who they were recruiting at the time. I think they just got in there and really couldn't figure that out. You know, they weren't used to having to space the timing of their words so much and had that kind of limitation. But I took to it. So they used me for things on a couple of deals. And I, I think it wasn't too long before they offered me the role of Napa. Um, but uh, I don't remember what the earlier roles were before that. They were probably just bit parts. Now, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I know you said like before you got the Napa, you wasn't really into the anime or like the voice, like just the video game in general. But how knowledgeable are you with a lot of the anime that you have done or a video game series that you have done? Not very knowledgeable, uh, although I started doing uh, convention appearances a little over a year ago. So that's helped because you meet a lot of fans, mm -hmm. you meet uh you learn what's important to them i i have definitely things that i'm a total nerd about just not anime stuff you know but if you like i was at a con last year it was a dragon ball con but james marsters who played spike and buffy was there because he's a big dragon ball fan and as you guys i'm sure rose knows he played uh piccolo in the uh horrible live action dragon ball from 2009 i think it was and um but he's a Dragon Ball fan. He's done some voice work on, I think, GT and Super just under a pseudonym just because he wanted to, you know. But in, in a in a fantasy con or in a Buffy event, he's a really big deal, you know. But at the Dragon Ball con, he was just kind of one of the guys. And I was doing everything I could to just act normal and not fangirl all over him every time <laughs> I talked to him because <laughs> uh, he's a good looking guy. Well, that didn't impress me as much as, although he does, he, he's older now, but he still looks really good. Well, we were backstage or uh, in the, in the, in the green room after the con was done. And, and there weren't many of us there. It was me, my agent, a JSA guy. And James was signing, he'd signed some prints. JSA was sort of authenticating them for him. So it was his last thing, you know, and he was like going on his social and kind of putting posts about great con it's over. And that was his last thing to do really. And he was like, oh, now I can just play some fucking Zelda. He had his he had his switch and he was ready to relax. And so I said to him, James, I, I had several interactions with you over the weekend. Did I did I seem relatively sane to you? You know, he's like, yeah, yeah, perfectly normal. I said, well, good, because I could totally uh like the the weebiest weeb out there, I could start going on about Buffy. I've watched that show through many, many times. You know, I was really trying to rein it in. And the JSA guy said, Oh, yeah, if my wife were here, she'd be freaking out right now. And this is how what I'm all this to point out what a nice guy Marshall was. He's like, oh, yeah, well, give me your phone. What's your name? And he just took the guy's phone and did like a cameo video. Like you could tell it was his cameo script he'd written. It was like a good it wasn't like one of those quick like, you know, oh, hey, Lava, I hear you like Buffy. Have a happy birthday. He had a whole thing he did. The coolest part was he holds his phone up and his body language changes. He takes on the cockney accent because he's an American guy, you know. And right there, he just becomes Spike. And my agent, who's as big a Buffy nerd as I am, he's 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 texting me, holy fucking shit. You know, we're sitting there just so cool. with our jaws open, you know. And he did that same video for like three of us, including me. Uh, but um, unfortunately, I don't know that. I'm not at that level with anime, although I've certainly met many fans who are. And, and so if I meet someone who really is into it, I'll just let them talk. And I, I kind of learn what are the things that, consistently come up like i've learned that uh even though he's only in part of the one season uh napa is really popular you know especially among uh i found like a military especially among them marines you know uh i think he reminds them of uh drill instructors in the usmc <laughs> you know so they kind of relate to him i don't know uh some people who millennials who were kids when they were growing up watching dragon after school they were being little kids and being actually scared of Napa. Yeah. I don't know. And some kids probably like the fact that, you know, uh, as, as is a common anime trope, the little bitty guy kicks his ass, you know, <laughs> and they took inspiration from that. I have a big question for you. I just want to ask you, and it is about the Dragon Ball Spark and Zero. Did you do any voices of Napa in Spark and Zero? That's one of the video games. The newest video game is supposed to come out. 
Uh, I got to be careful what I say, because if it still hasn't come out yet, we're under NDAs. Oh, okay. And they really, uh, uh, Bandai really slaps us hard if, if we start okay. to get posted. But I will say that um, as far as I know, I got the Napa role in 2002. You know, I wasn't the first English language Napa. Some older millennials who grew up watching Dragon Ball in the afternoons in the 90s think, oh, you were my childhood. And I don't, I don't, I've stopped correcting them because it's so much to explain. Well, no, there was actually a guy from Canada. He was the first Napa. He set the template. Briefly, Chris Sabat actually was the voice of Napa because when they first, Funimation first put it on Toonami, he and Sean Schimmel, as I understand it, were pretty much doing almost all the voices between them because they were just trying to crank it out as quickly as possible. Uh, but in the early 2000s, when they decided to start putting on Cartoon Network and doing DVDs and so forth, that's when they thought, let's, let's, you know, make a bigger cast. Plus, Sabat was becoming so busy, he couldn't do that anyway. Uh, that's when I got the role. Um, and that first video game we did, I think it was Budokai. I, I've pretty much been me in every game since then. So if okay. nothing's Budokai. in the game, it's going to be me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you a question, right? This is one that I didn't have written down. But once you said something about Spark and Zero, I've thought about the problems that voice actors had recently with Storm Connection. A lot of them was getting... You know, some of band I was using AI generated stuff, maybe like stuff from old video games. How do you feel about AI technology right this minute? And also a part two question to that. Um, has you have anything like that happened to you where you know they might have used some of your old work for new video games or maybe voice over Napa using some previous work you've done? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I do know that they were not going to bring me in a couple of years ago for, and I forget which game it was, um, because in the game, Napa didn't have any lines that he hadn't said before. And so, uh, Bandai had said, you can use old stuff. Now the, the studio Okratron that does the games, um, director's like, we don't want to do that because to, to the directors and the engineers, their ears are so attuned because they do this for a living. They can't stand to mix like something recorded five years ago, you know, on different equipment or whatever. They can hear the difference. Like, no, we want it, we want consistency. So we'll bring you in. But that decision by Bandai may have been influenced by the fact that the original Japanese uh Napa voice actor died. At that time they were recording, he was very sick and he died a few months later. So it mm. might have been he just couldn't do it. Yeah. And so they deliberately pulled old stuff. I don't know. But in the future, who knows? I mean, AI is it's a runaway train at this point. What are some of the other things that you're passionate about outside of voice acting? I know you just said that you was a huge nerd and fan of some of the other pop, you know, culture things that they might have, like Star Wars, Star Trek, things like that, Marvel. What's some of the things that you're passionate about besides voice acting? Oh, well, as far as fandom goes, yeah, I definitely used to be hardcore Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, but the franchise has gotten away from me. Like, I don't watch the new Trek. I've tried, you know. Uh, and it's just, it's so different. It it doesn't speak to me. I, I, I remember thinking that about when, when I was young and the next generation came out, I remember there were old Star, old Star Trek farts. He'd be like, yeah, it's not the same. You need Kirk and Spock. Who's this bald guy? It's a bunch of bullshit, you know? And I was like, ah, oh, you guys are just stuck in an old way of thinking, but I've become that guy because, um, uh, although there's some, I haven't checked out that I hear are really good. I hear, uh, I can't remember all the names of them now. They make so much stuff, you know. And the Star Wars, same thing. I, I have watched Mandalorian, a lot of the series, but Star Wars has gotten so big and bloated that, and I and the, the modern hardcore Star Wars fans, they know all the novels and the comics, you know, and and they're tying in all the continuity. The video game lore is part of it. So a character shows up on a live action series and that only appeared in a game before. Um, but when I was so we lost Rose. Uh, when I was like. I was eight years old when the original first Star Wars came out. And it was my religion. I mean, you know, and pre-internet, you just had to get whatever scraps information you could find, which meant comics, trading cards, uh, articles in magazines, you know. And, uh, but the novelization, because there'd be some little detail in there. Yeah, that, they connect know. everything. Every detail yeah. is connected. That, that could be the cool part, though. You never know. You could get a Star Wars role, end up in the anime, 
I mean, in, in you know, a cartoon and end up in a movie somewhere. Would you ever be interested in something like that? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll work wherever. I mean, I got excited once because I got an audition in the email, uh, in an email from Warner Brothers Studios. Um, and I'm more of a DC guy than Marvel. So, of course, all that stuff, all the the Bruce Timm series from the 90s, I mean... Uh, a huge huge fan of those and so this was not at all a dc project at all but just the fact that it was wb you know studio that made animaniacs i was just very excited and uh i i think whoever was casting must have been an anime fan because they they kind of sought me out um i didn't get the part but still it was exciting just to audition for it now i was i guess you could say stalking your ig and i noticed you do like a, a a miniature cosplay, but the cosplay you do are of Austin Powers. I seen the Grinch. What made you want to do Austin Powers? Is that like a part of the detective thing, or do you just enjoy Austin Powers? Well, I don't do cosplay. That's actually um, even before I was doing uh, voice work. Actually, kind of because of it, uh, I'm a celebrity impersonator, and Austin Powers is a character I started doing back in. <laughs> God, when the movies were out, like in the late 90s, um, I'd always, my background, I was in comedy troops a lot in the 90s, and I was always the guy that did impressions, you know, um, and I, for our sketches, I rarely went to the trouble of dressing up, I might put a wig on or something, but mostly, but I was doing a show, a murder mystery show, and yeah, we were doing a 60s theme, and we wanted the detective to be Austin Powers, so that's the first time I actually fully dressed up like a character for a part, and the very first show we did, there was somebody there going, hey, we're with this company and we're doing this big thing in Vegas and we, do you have a card? Because we'd like to hire you to come help us with it. And I kind of discovered the world of impersonators. Um, and it's a very legitimate way to make a living, especially back then. I didn't know, I, I'd always thought of like, I, you know, like the the woman who thinks she's Marilyn Monroe and, and mm. does the voice all the time and stuff, makes you call her Marilyn. I thought they were all kooks, you know? And then I started working in that world, meeting people. Goes, oh, they're just actors making a living, you know. Uh, but I, uh, I've done lots of Mike Myers characters. Actually, I did. I did Austin Doctor Evil. There was a time that's all I did. I still do it sometimes. I still have, uh, like, I New Year's Eve. This big restaurant was doing this big New Year's Eve party, and it was uh, swingy sixties themed. They had like a Beatles cover band playing, so they sought me out and hired me to come be there and MC and. And of course, but that's but it's not cosplay. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm I'm not just putting a suit on. It. It's a full on characterization. How is it talking with the particular teeth? Was that very hard to get used to? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny you ask that, Lava. You must have worn some prosthetic teeth before for you to. You know, I have. I yeah, have. You know. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Star Trek, I don't know if you ever saw Deep Space Nine, but my hats were always off to the guys that did the Ferengi because they wore top and bottom teeth, in addition to all that makeup they had on, mm. and. We're still able to be clear. I don't know how they did it. Yeah, the first set I had, um, it had a back piece that kind of connected behind. And it's right where your tongue goes to the back of your, behind your teeth to make your T sounds and S's. And so those came up, you know, very difficult at first. But I eventually figured out how to, the guy was making my teeth. Now just make them wider and take that back piece off. So now I put them in and just talk and it's not a problem. All right. Um, I wanted to go ahead and ask you that. Um, are you in the new project, Dragon Ball Dima? I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. If I, I, but you know, with the Dragon Ball, I mean, something that comes up every every few months, and you go in and record. So is, yeah. is that another game, Rose, or is that a? a That's a, the new anime series. Oh, are they Dima? Now, are they? I heard about that. Are they like? Is it a fresh reboot? It's supposed to be like a new series, I guess. Yeah, it's supposed to be a fresh reboot. It's not part of, it's not like, I think it's supposed to go connected to the um Super, but I think this is like Toriyama own, his own type of thing, like original okay. series. And did they, I think I saw something, did they just, did they declare Super and GT to be canon where they were fence, on the fence about it for years? Has that been the confirmed or are they still saying? I, st I still think they saying that it's not confirmed, or like canon, GT. They're not, it's not canon. Leaving a back door open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah um no i don't know if or i don't know that crunchy's even doing the dub for that i mean for dima yeah oh okay so i, was just no, I don't think so 
It'd okay. be nice to get called into some completely different voice, though. Maybe a character yeah. would die in like seven episodes. That'd be awesome. <laughs> well, I well you know, it though. still is in early production and early development. So, you know, usually, let me ask you a question. Like when an uh, anime, like say there's an anime that just came out, something like Solo Leveling, right? When animes first come out, how long does it take for them to start calling the English dub voice actors to get to work and start working on some of these projects? Well, I've never worked at the studio as a director or an engineer, like part of the staff. They would answer those questions better. A lot of your actors do that stuff. But I, I do know that it's a pretty fast time crunch nowadays in the simuldub era. When I first started doing it, we were still in the, you know, Dragon Ball itself was like already 13, 14 years old by the time I was recording my lines, you know, mm. and like Lupin Third was too. All those animes were years old, which was I miss those days in a way because if you got cast on a show, the director already knew the series. Yeah, you, know, you get the role and go, oh, yeah, your guy is like seems like a good guy at first, but halfway through it turns out he's plotting and he's a villain, and and you can you can make choices about how to play it because you know what's going to happen. Uh, but once we got to the simul dub era, where we're just a week behind the actual production of the show in Japan, you know we don't know. Sometimes mm -hmm. you get cast that goes, I think this guy might be a big deal, so you've been a lot of episodes, and then you die next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right uh, um speaking of animes out there are there any upcoming animes you might have heard about or any ongoing anime series that you would like to like to be on uh i just like to work so mm. you know i'm not really I respect picky. that the grind is serious yeah i mean i i uh i sent an audition for a show um just last week i wrote it was called i haven't heard back on that one um I am working on one right now, which I uh, can't get specific, but it's it's going to be a movie of a very popular series. And mm -hmm. I don't even know for sure it's going to be in the theaters or it's going to be a direct to streaming thing or whatever, but we're currently working on that. So, Okay. Now, this is kind of like a two-part question. I love you as Kenny Ackerman from Attack on Titans. Now, my question is, what fandom is worth that you have interact with? The Attack on Titan fandom or the Dragon Ball Z fandom? Which one is worse? Which one is worse? They're both <laughs> bad in the anime community. So which one is the worst <laughs> that you interacted with? Well, I've, <laughs> I haven't had negative reaction uh, interaction with either one of them. Uh, I would say in terms of getting so weeby that you can't really relate to them, definitely Dragon Ball. Oh yeah. my god! I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I don't mean to paint with a broad brush, Rose. Uh, I just mean like, if there's gonna be somebody who you know, because you you meet fans who are deep on the spectrum or something, like they like, you know, and and they can't really relate to you on a one to one face level, you know, which so some the things they're obsessed with, and in, in this case, Dragon Ball is how they're relating to you. So they're not really talking to you as a person; they're talking about you know, the show and what they think. And they're, yeah, they're asking you questions, not really waiting for your answer. They're just kind of wanting to talk about it, you know? And I, I've, <laughs> you know, I've, I've worked with lots of guys with different parts of the spectrum. So I've learned how to, you know, kind of read that and just let them go. And it's not a problem, but I haven't had that as much with AOT. I mean, AOT is usually a little more, um, uh, I get a little more of a sense of it's just a show, you know? Yeah. Uh, now, did you watch Attack on Titans? That is, I tell you, it goes back to your question earlier. That is the one show I do want to get into. I've only seen the first episode. I was waiting for it to finish, which now it has. I think the last dub yeah. episode went up. So uh, that's what I want to dive into. Since I had my Crunchyroll subscription, which I have to pay for. <laughs> when it was Funimation, uh, they gave us Funimation Now subscriptions. For free? But I, yeah, but after the merger, they, they go, no, if you want a Crunchyroll, you can pay for it. So. I just want to say you did an amazing job as Kenny Ackerman, and you are the reason why he's my favorite character from the series. A lot of people ask, why is Kenny Ackerman your favorite? I'm like, because he's badass. And if it wasn't for Kenny, you 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 just watch. When you watch it, you understand why I say Kenny is the reason why a particular character is powerful. So <laughs> thank you. Well, he he's he's people say, what's your favorite character you've ever done voice acting? He is my answer. He is my favorite one. Just because... I was just going to ask that. Another one season character, you know, but he um, he has a real arc. I just like the fact as an actor, you get to play a guy who, you know, he appears as like just uh, a firebomb, you know, flops in, slaughters half of Levi's friends, you know, like a like a mad dog needs to be put down. 
And then by the time he dies, you almost feel bad for him. I mean, that's that's a lot of range to get to play, a lot of nuance. And um, it was a lot of fun. Also, I always tell people that it was nice, too, because you know, I'm based in Dallas. That's where Funimation and now Crunchyroll is. And so I grew up in Texas like a lot of the actors have. And they were always very hardcore about don't ever do any kind of Southern twang on a voice, even if it's some... I don't care if it's Shin Chan and it's the craziest, most cartoony character you can think of. Do not give it a Southern twang. They wanted to keep that a secret that we were in Texas. I think they wanted to create the illusion we were in LA or New York or something. I don't know what it is. But with Kenny, because he had kind of a Western vibe to him, they were like, yeah, go ahead. Give him that kind of, you know, long time, Levi. And get, you know, he can lean into the Texas part. So that that was alone was fun about that character. I think that's why I love this so much. My dad is from down south and you just, you executed that particular voice perfectly. Oh, thanks, Lava. So, amazing. I want to ask you, how do you feel about Dragon Ball Un Unbridged? Like, how do you feel about that? Oh, I love it. I, oh, so, they, so do you like they, Ghost Nappa? Yeah, had they, had they called me, I would have done it. I mean, they True? did Ghost Nappa than the real show ever did. I mean, come on. Uh, the only time... I think Nap only got resurrected twice kind of in the real shows like that brief mod. I get super and GT mixed up. So I, I think it's super where is it super where he got resurrected just for a second and Vegeta killed him right away. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't even speak. I didn't even come in for that. And then I think <laughs> on GT, there was a moment where Krillin had to go back and face down his old foes and fears some I'm kind talking of about, yeah. journal I'm yeah and he was in about, some yeah. cave and it was full of images of napa just surrounding him uh -huh. and uh laughing and they didn't pull old laughs i did come in for that i did actually get on the you came in just to laugh <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> <a bunch laughs> again. that's um, why that's yeah. why um but a bridge had the ghost napa and all the comedy and it's just fun i consider uh takahata 101 the guy who did um napa for a bridge as a legitimate fourth english language napa you know oh that's that's, that's yeah cool. I, I count him along with me sabbath and, and michael dobson who originated the role that's actually pretty cool i i, I respect that and All i right, went to um, interview he was saying because i listened to him i thought he sounded just like me you know <laughs> And he said, no, I was doing my bad impression of Michael Dobson. But that's really what we all were doing. I mean, when I got the part, that's all I did. They they played some some Michael Dobson and said, here, can you sound like this? And I did an impression. And that's that's why it was it. I know you go to a lot of cons. Um, that's mostly like what a lot of voice actors are doing nowadays. Um, going to comic cons, going to conventions, all types of things, right? What's the one line people come up to you and like, hey, can you do this for me? Can you? Because I know y'all must hear that so much. And how exhausting is that maybe on your voice when you're at some of these cons? Oh, it's not bad. Um, probably not surprisingly, the one I get the most is uh so cool, man. So, right. You know, because so cool, that's so cool. Part of a famous meme, you know. Um, so fire, bro. And it's not bad. I mean, because Napa, uh, I did, I've done it so many times that I can go right into Napa. Now, occasionally you'll get the deep cut fan, the deep track fan who's like, they want to hear something from some anime you did 12 years ago that you totally forgot about. You know, can you do something in this voice? And I got no idea what I did for that character, you know, and I can't even <laughs> find it on online to find a reference or anything. You know, that's that's what's hard because you, you want to recreate it accurately for them. But, uh, you know. It was a day on the job back in the Obama administration. So, you know, it's been too long. <laughs> hey, Vegeta, what does the scouter say about his power level? What? Over 9,000? There's no way that can be right. That was beautiful, man. That was beautiful. Bro. Thank you so much for that, man. <laughs> beautiful, man. Um, yes, and if you're in the chat, man, please do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Follow Voice of the Heroes. We have some of the most popular voice actors from all your famous animes. How does a fair fail sharing a name with a NASCAR driver? And has anybody ever went to a convention expecting to see the NASCAR driver? <laughs> no, that hasn't happened yet. I remember when I was first starting out, because when you're an actor, you first start, you're like, hey, I wonder if I'm on the internet or I wonder if I'm on IMDb. And 
you know, I, if I Googled my name, it was all Phil Parsons, the NASCAR driver. And, and I'd be way, way deep sea. I'd have to go down two pages. Oh, there I am, you know, brief mention. Uh, but now I don't have to, I can put Phil Parsons without putting voice actor on it. And I do come up. He still is, you know, um, the first couple of listings, but I do, I do pop up. Uh, no, I've never been a real big NASCAR guy. So, um, yeah, I never gave much thought to it. And I think he's not one of the biggest names in NASCAR. Of course, I'm not one of the biggest names in anime. So I guess we're on the same level in our respective yeah, fields. But you got to be the biggest shot up. When you Google Phil Parsons, you come up. And you come I up. Am, man. So big shout out to you, you come my up. guy. Um, and let me just say, Hell's Paradise is an amazing. You did great in Hell's oh, Paradise. Oh, thanks. I appreciate well. that. Yeah. Uh, I, now that, wait, that's so a show that I also will Paradise? probably say. He's still in Hell's Paradise. Let's yeah, go. yeah. Well, he's, we'll the old, he's the old guy, the old, the old guy with the long stash. He's like the badass one. Gentetsu Sai. He he gets bit by one of those fucked up bugs with the human face. Let's go. That's you. Yeah. Yo, that's one of my <laughs> favorite new animes. I'm not even gonna lie. I think it's like right now for me is Hell's Paradise solo leveling, JJK, Demon Slayer, etc. But man, you are so awesome. And yeah, you're definitely one of the baddest. Of the bad in there. Uh, how does it feel playing that character? And how did you get that role? Um, that was uh Mike McFarlane is directing that show, uh, who, you know, is one of the uh original OG uh greatest directors at Funimation now Crunchyroll. He directed me on Attack on Titan. I think he even directed me a little bit on Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball had different directors, mostly it was Sabbath, but anyway, um, He's used me in a lot of shows and he gave me that part and um it's great. The guy's, you know, he's a badass. He's got a little comedy in there. Um, and I'm told that I haven't read the manga, but I'm told he has a lot of interesting things yet to do. So if they keep that in the adaptation, then there should be some more fun stuff in season two. I just want to say you will be around longer than the seven episodes you were saying, is all I'm gonna say. <laughs> yeah, it'd be no nice to make it to the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's my Finally, dream right? most, uh, of, let me make most of my characters die and i usually rank them based on their deaths um you know napa mm. died like a bitch but uh, <laughs> kenny kenny had a very poignant death um the probably the best death scene was did you guys watch uh full metal alchemist brotherhood yeah i've seen that all right that's so my guy movie. in that his name was buccaneer if you remember he was major armstrong's right hand guy yeah. hawk and the chainsaw auto mail he went out like a boss. He, he did had a massive fight. Took a lot of guys with him, you know. So that's one of your favorite death scenes out of all your characters. Yeah, well, he definitely, definitely the best death scene. Okay, uh, cool. All right. Um, I want to go ahead and ask you. I'm sorry that all my stuff is like Dragon Ball questions. I'm no, just a Dragon cool, Ball meathead, ever. So I just wanted to ask you. Um, do you play any Dragon Ball games? And if you do, which one is the worst one to you? No, I never played them. Um, I thought about playing Kakarot just because I I enjoyed doing that. Like Nappa has never been more loquacious. They gave him so many lines. He had a whole story in that one. It was fun yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's my favorite thing to say as Nappa whenever we record is is Kakarot because just that voice you can just Kakarot. You just really chew on it, you know. Um, uh -huh. but uh, I think I they gave us a complimentary copy of probably that original Budokai. First Which I always one. wanted to play just because that was my first kind of out in the real world recognition moment. I was, uh, I don't know, you guys, you guys all live in the West Coast? I'm in the East. Okay, East so Coast. I don't know, I don't know if Rose ever saw these, but uh, you guys remember Fry's Electronics, right? Yeah. Can you say, what is it? Uh, Fry's, Fry's Electronics. Yeah. No, I don't know used, what that is. Used to be a big electronics chain, not as big as Best Buy, but they were big in the West and they even had them here in Texas. Anyway, I was in one one day and uh, I'm walking back to the TVs or something and I hear like, come here, you're right, or something. And they've got Budokai on the PS2 demo playing and it's like, you know, Kakarot versus right. Krillin or something. And uh, it was uh, it was really cool. I was like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> there's dude playing. Oh, that's my voice, man. I did that. And he's like, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> And see, back then, That's I fine. couldn't call up. It was pre-smartphone. I couldn't call up any proof, you know. Okay. All right. Okay. I got a question, right? Because we were just talking about so many of your characters has died in anime. You actually have one that's still ongoing in one of the most popular animes in the world right now, My Hero Academia. You play the class president. 
Um, new season is on its way for those that don't know. Make sure y'all check it out. Can you tell us how much of a role or impact he plays in the newest season? Uh, no idea. You know, he's, I think, only in, I think, three episodes. Um, but a lot of people will think he's more than that because he he's such an important uh, figure um, to Tenya that they think he has a bigger presence than he does. Um, so I don't know. What I do, I have heard they're going to adapt the prequel manga, Vigilantes. Mm. And he has a bigger, it's back when, and it's so it's just back when he was active and so forth before he gets crippled by stain. So I'm hoping that we get, we adapt that and I get to reprise the role. Yeah, I hope so too, because he's a yeah. great, kind of annoying in Ultra Rumble. <laughs> Not going to lie. He is, he is <laughs> crazy in the video game. Like, he's the one that just chases you around all day. If you're watching right. Voice of the Heroes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more voice actors. Check us out. Hit that subscribe button. Also, follow our Patreon for uncut interviews and more exclusives. Right now, we got videos up with Michael Yurchak, Amanda C. Miller, Michael Swalby, and so many more voice actors. We have interviews coming up with Neil Kaplan and also John um, Swayze, so make sure you stay tuned to the channel. Don't forget to hit that like, comment, and subscribe button. Now, Phil, let them know where they can find you at on social medias, and let them know what co um, cons you have coming up. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, you can find me at Phil Parsons underscore voice actor on, on Instagram. Um, DM me if you want. I love to meet fans. Uh, and yeah, I'll be in San Antonio in, in February at Anime, Anime Hero Con, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, at St. Louis Anime Con, EC3 Con in Uncasville, Connecticut, Anime Las Vegas in late March, um, and the weekend after that I'll be in Sacramento, California at SAC Anime, um, and more after that, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Phil, for coming by today. It was such a pleasure meeting you. Lava, let them know where they can find you at on social media. You can find me at Senpai Lavatron on all platforms, TikTok, IG, and X. President Rose, let them know where they can find you at. Find me on YouTube, Bit President Rose, um, YouTube and Twitter, President Rose one. Appreciate everybody for coming through today. Thank y'all so much. Have a blessed one. And don't forget to follow Voice of the Heroes, like, comment, and subscribe. Sing it with me, pretty Kelly.